And this is the free talk. We are talking politics ahead of the 2023 general elections. And now the people of Zimbabwe would want to know what is the alternative before everyone or anyone goes to vote. They want to know what's on the table. Now, we know the policies of ZANU-PF because they are the ruling party and they continue to talk about their policies and repeat their policies. But what is the alternative? Now, we are going to find out what is the alternative when you go to 2023 into the ballot. What is the alternative from what is currently existing? And for that, we are turning to the new baby in town, CCC. We are going to hear what are their policies, what do they want to offer this country if the people of Zimbabwe elect them into authority. Now join me just after this break on this, the free talk in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and I, your host as usual, Dara B. Welcome back to this edition of this, the free talk, where we're talking alternative policies 2023 as we go to vote. Now, joining me here is the Triple C spokesperson, Fadzai Mahere, and we're going to be talking about the hot topics, the issues that you, the people, have been raising. Some of them around the issues around policy of the CCC, its um, structures, if they have any, and other issues in the political that are affecting the current political social discourse in Zimbabwe. Now, thank you very much for joining me, Advocate Mayere. Thank you very much, Blessed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Beautiful. Now, let's just cut to the chase. The biggest story that is going around, uh, Advocate Mayere, is that the CCC is a one-man band. It has no structures. Let's talk about that aspect. Well, thank you, Blessed. Obviously, it's a fallacy uh, that the Citizens Coalition for Change is a one-man band. To the contrary, um, what our six-month lifespan has shown us is that it is a broad-based citizens' movement uh, that has defied all the odds, that is a broad tent for all Zimbabweans who are citizens and who want hope, accountability and development to come through. Uh, no party that is not organized can win elections in the way that we've been winning and so decisively. 
um, the citizens will no doubt be aware that we pulled some of the biggest crowds that have been seen uh, possibly since independence. Zimbabwe, Grand, Sakubva, Mashing, Gogo, all around the country. That's not a one-man band. That is a movement. There's definitely, um, you know, a strong sense that a new style of doing politics in the country has been birthed. And, you know, frankly, it's a huge opportunity uh, which we've embraced with open arms to really deliver something special for the people of Zimbabwe. Yeah, but when, when in politics, when they talk about structures, uh, they talk about who is your president, who is your vice president, who is supporting the president in terms of their positions. And when you go out, you've got, uh, do you, are you uh, vis or present in a provincial uh, form and st stuff like that. And it, it looks like um, you have said that everyone, this is a citizen thing and there's no position. Now, how do you have, you know, an organized thing when everyone just does anything? Well, it's not the case that everyone does anything uh, because, you know, even if you look at where we've won, we've won all across the country in almost all provinces, whether you're talking of Kariba, Chipinge, all across the country, uh, Harare, anywhere you go, Blawayo, the Triple C is winning. And you don't win by just wishing and hoping and doing any odd thing. There's certainly a method to the madness. Now, what President Chamisa has said time and again is that this party is yet to launch. But we don't want politics that's business as usual. We saw how ZANU-PF created its formation. It didn't work for the Zimbabwean people. We saw how the MDC, by whatever name called, set itself up. That didn't work for the people. And so it was certainly time to start doing things differently, to depart from the old way. And I think the fallacy that exists in the discourse at the moment is that the only way to structure a political party is the way ZANU-PF is structured. Uh, you know, a grand police bureau by whatever name called and, you know, X, Y, Z in the organization. Now, what we are doing, most importantly, and I think this is the big uh, thing that distinguishes the Triple C, is that we're going to the people and saying to the people, what do you want your structure to be? It's not a process of, you know, President Nelson Chamisa having a top-down pushing and foisting and imposing on the citizens that this is who you are. We've been having deep, intensive conversations across all the provinces of the country to hear from the people, every village, every street, every province. What do you want the new baby to look like? It's not an elite conversation, it's one that's driven from the grassroots. And I think what we've said consistently is we're yet to launch pole pole, trust the process. When we launch all these things, we're collating all the information that we're gathering from the citizens and it will be unveiled. Um, but for now, we certainly have interim measures in place and they've, they've been extremely effective. You know, one thing that's not talked about enough in the discourse is that for every single by-election, and I think by now they've been over 200, we've had at least four polling agents at every single polling station. You don't do that if you're not organized. You don't do that if you don't have a broad base of support. You don't do that if there's not a clear chain of command. You don't do that if you're not hugely popular. But why are you keeping your clear chain of command a secret? Because people... That's not a secret. I think we, we've said consistently, we know who our chain champion in chief is. We know who interim point persons are. You're speaking to me today. You know, there is an interim structure in place. And if people are to be honest with themselves, uh, which some of the political commentators are not being, President Chamisa said at the, rally, at the rallies that there are interim people in place but we want to launch and we want to launch big and properly. And we're not going, going to launch something that goes against what the people want. We're going to give the people exactly what they want. Some people have accused you of rather using the MDC Alliance structures. Can we, let's talk about that. Well, that's, say, that's obviously again uh, a fallacy. The MDC Alliance structures remain with the MDC Alliance. Uh, Monzo are still there. His constitutive documents are still in place. He says he's going to have a Congress, even though they're quibbling about that. We haven't taken anything. In fact, we've been very deliberate about ensuring that we don't replicate um, the old 
MDC Alliance. This is a completely new way of doing business. Even if you look at um, how we've run our elections so far, that's not how the MDC used to do it. Even the language we speak, the values, the mission, all of that is completely different. Different symbols, different logos, everything is completely different. And so, uh, you know, if you look at the evidence, the contention that we're still the MDC Alliance simply doesn't hold. Mm. But they say that you just changed the name. And, and, and let's talk about that. Um, I think this is one thing that you not, uh, have not had an opportunity to address where they say that this is just rebranding. You are still, uh, your president is, uh, is still Nelson Chamisa was the president of the MDC Alliance. Your vice presidents are still the same. You, the point person, is the spokesperson. You're the spokesperson of the MDC Alliance. You're still the spokesperson, yeah. So this is just... A, a replication of, of the old. Well, I mean, that's a contradiction in terms. On the one hand, you're saying we don't have structures. In the same breath, you're saying it's the same structures of the, of the MDC Alliance. The truth of the matter is that we're yet to launch. We're a new party that's going to have a completely new setup uh, from the way that people have been used to it. Even our founding documents, our constitutive documents, how we set ourselves up and how we operate, all of that's going to be different. And I think what we've humbly asked the citizens is to bear with us. When the launch happens, we can have this conversation again, Dara, mm -hmm. and you can tell me, is it the same? Is it business as usual? And it's been far from just a rebranding, completely different. I mean, if you put the MDC Alliance led by Munzura here, and you put the triple C there. I mean, the difference is night and day. Uh, different language, different approach, different colors, different symbols, different, uh, even our ethos, uh, which is an ethos of putting citizens at the center of all decision making. That never used to happen in the MDC. It would just be announced one day that this is your constitution, this is your symbol, this is what we're now doing. That's not what we're doing this time. This time we're going right to the people. What do you want? What do you want your slogan to be? What do you want your symbol to be? What, how do you want to choose your candidates? If you look at the, ma the manner in which the Triple C is choosing candidates, and especially how we're going to be doing so for 2023, it's a complete departure, not just from the MDC, but from the way all political parties in this country have done it before. We're saying it's going to be community-led, Citizens are going to be able to pick and say in X community, we want this person. In Y community, we want this person. It's, we're not a political party in the sense that Zimbabweans understand it. We're a, a broad-based movement where all citizens have space. In fact, we've opened the door. If you uh, looked at the way the, the MDC Alliance operated and operates now, there's a lot of gatekeeping. There's no room for fresh voices, uh, you know, fresh faces, new people uh, to get into politics, new candidates to run, and yet the Triple C is offering precisely that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you'll see when we get to 23, uh, 2023, when we launch our campaign, when we launch the, the movement formally, uh, when, you, when we launch our constitutive documents, all of these things will be made clear. All of our internal processes are going to be laid out bare for all the citizens uh, to see, and it's going to actually be a product of what the citizens themselves have been telling us. Let's talk about your constitutive document. Are you saying at this present moment you're not a legal persona? No, of course we are. And I mean, any lawyer will tell you that, you know, a, a movement, especially one that's participated in politics and is a voluntary association, uh, you know, that has an agreement and consensus amongst its members about how it will operate as an absolute uh, legal persona. But you that's need a constitution to do that. Yes, a constitution is not always at the time that is it's written, and you don't actually need a constitution in the way that you're thinking about it. I mean, a number of churches, for example, are legal entities. They don't have constitutions. I'm not saying we don't have a constitution. I'm saying the constitution will be unveiled in due course. Do you have it? Oh, yes, but it's the product of broad-based citizens, uh, you know, consultation and it's going to be unveiled at the appropriate time. But where time. did this consultation take place? Oh, I mean, okay, in, uh, that's in a homes? great question. That's a great question. You recall mm. uh, President Chamisa last year did a number of Meet the People tours. If you recall, you know, our 
And it's unfortunate that, you know, we don't, in fact, it's fortunate. We don't talk about this all the time because we need to protect the citizens we consult, especially when we're talking uh, in rural areas. We've been having these meet the people tours. Uh, and, you know, President Chamisa spoke of how he was speaking to special interest groups. He went all around uh, a number of provinces and he's been doing so repeatedly as have uh, a number of our members throughout the country. Every single district uh, of Zimbabwe is covered. That's where these consultations are taking place. Uh, and they obviously are not yet complete. We're going to continue to speak to, to the citizens, to experts, to you know, friends of uh, the struggle to get their input. And what I can guarantee you is that the outcome is going to be something that we can all be proud of, something that's got space for every single Zimbabwean who wants progress and dignity and prosperity for all, uh, and for everyone who really believes in our mission, which is really to deliver on improving the lives of Zimbabwean mm -hmm. people. Enter Chan, you know, and he comes into Zimbabwe, and just as he comes through uh, you announcing uh, point persons in parliament, uh, you now have a chief whip, and this has been taken to mean that you take orders from, uh, from Europe, that Chen came to deliver uh, orders to you. Now, let us talk about that. Why now, are you taking orders from Europe? Now, I mean, obviously, let's, let's be very clear about one thing. Uh, the Triple C is not taking orders from anyone. Uh, except the citizens of Zimbabwe. You know, that there may have been a coincidence. Of course, we meet and hear a number of academics, uh, you know, most of which we don't actually talk about. We, we, we speak to heads of state, we speak to leading academics, we speak to political scientists, we speak to economists every single day because, you know, what we want to come up with at the end of the day is something that's robust, something that is timeless and something that delivers uh, because clearly uh, the politics that has been done for the last 20 years hasn't delivered on, on, on the promise. Now, if you know how decisions are made, it's never the case that, you know, Blessed comes, has a meeting with Fazi tomorrow, a letter is written to Parliament. That's not how things work. You know, um, that parliamentary process had been in motion uh, for a number of weeks. Uh, and it, it's just a coincidence that, um, you know, it was announced just shortly after uh, the meeting had been advertised by, by himself. Now, I want to just say something that's important. You know, if you want to look at how we are organized as an organization, Parliament, our role in present and pa presence in Parliament is extremely important. And I think you've also seen the way we, uh, our deployees are handling both parliamentary and council business. It's completely different from the past. There's been a huge break from the past. If you look at how the Pomona deal has been handled, if you look at uh, how a number of corruption scandals have been dealt with, um, the economy, for example, there's a completely different way of doing things. And all that uh, we were organizing with our parliamentary spokespersons was to ensure that everybody has a man and everybody has a, an area that they're going to look at, consult with experts, speak to, you know, go, you know, beyond the superficial in respect of. But that is not the organization of the Triple C as Chan contends. The, the Triple C is much bigger uh, than the number of MPs that we have in Parliament. So to try and collate those two and say there's some sort of connection is obviously uh, misplaced. We don't take instructions from anyone uh, who is not a citizen of Zimbabwe. And you know, our processes have been very transparent. When we're going out to meet the people, we say in clear terms, we're going to meet the people and we're going to hear them. What we might not say, blessed, is that we've met you, Kunjanja, in this village, Tayendapana Mhlanga. That's not how we operate because we can't do that for the safety of our citizens. But we are consulting. And it's what the citizens, the outcome of what the citizens uh, have decided that we're then going to launch and come out with and announce at the appropriate time. People are, are interested also um, to know about the policy and ideology of the Triple C. What is it? What, what do you stand for uh, since you have said you have broken from the past? Uh, in a sentence, in one line, uh, the philosophy that guides us is that we want citizens to be at the center of all decision making the center of all processes. We don't want a public health policy that does not have the, the welfare and interests of the citizens at the center. We don't want a public education framework that is divorced from the needs uh, of the citizens. We don't want an economy that serves uh, you know, a few political elites who are corrupt, who get 
access to gold coins at special rates and who get access to foreign currency on the forex auction but doesn't put citizens at the center. We don't want infrastructure that only benefits just a few people. We want the economy and the wealth and the resources of this country to benefit every single citizen. So our philosophy is about putting the citizens at the center of all political decision making from internal processes, external processes, when we form a people's government in, or a citizen's government in 2023, the movement promises that our leaders will be ethical and will put the citizens back at the center of all decision making. But what, what would, is, it go, is going to be different? Because then PF says it's Gutsarujinji, it's the People's Party. Or maybe it in is... 1980, certainly not now. There's no Gutsarujinji at the moment. Certainly the Zimbabwe that we are uh, experiencing now has nothing to do with Gutsa Rujinji. It's all about Gutsa Mnangagwa, Gutsa friends of ZANU-PF, Gutsa political elites, Gutsa a few Russian oligarchs. It's got nothing to do with putting the citizens at the center. Just look at Parinyatwa, look at Mpilo, look at any public hospital that's frequented by the citizens. It doesn't even have paracetamol, let alone gloves, let alone uh, radiotherapy machines, let alone, you know, hypertensive medication. It's got nothing in there it's just beds and that's why most of the wards are actually empty look at the schools the truth of the matter is that our young citizens our, our younger generation is not uh, you know getting any sort of quality education the teachers are simply not teaching because they're not earning a living wage you can't even speak of Gutsa Rujinji in the shops. How do you speak of Gutsa Rujinji when a loaf of bread is two US dollars? When cooking oil is between five and eight US dollars? When someone goes into a shop with 10 US dollars and can barely buy anything? But how are you going but to, to try bring the and prices get... down? You oh, talk that's about... a fantastic question. We've spoken time and again about our economic policy. I mean, the starting point is trust and confidence. Uh, that's that's the beginning of it and then obviously we have to as a short-term measure dollarize we need to solve the currency crisis at its root not this piecemeal approach that's being adopted by um tuling Nguyen nangagwa and zanu pf once we dollarize and once there's stability the next step is to adopt a currency board to ensure that we've got a sustainable currency for the long term we also need to resolve our long-standing debt crisis there has to be fiscal consolidation there has to be more prudent spending we have to get rid of the scourge of corruption. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, Zach itself reports that $2 billion is lost every single year to corruption, that's money that should go into infrastructure, money that should go into funding our public hospitals. To fund our public hos hospitals, we barely need between $50 million and $100 million, and yet they're stealing 200 and they're stealing $2 billion. Uh, $100 million every single month is lost to illicit gold flows, gold smuggling. So clearly Zimbabwe is a country that's not poor. It's poorly managed, and those are some of the things that we'll attend to uh, when we solve the, the economic crisis that our country faces. Um, it's also important to note that it's an indictment on Mr. Mnangagwa's regime that one in two Zimbabweans lives in extreme poverty. I mean, the rates of poverty have increased. Uh, you know, he's, he came into power saying, look, I'll create jobs, and all he's done is create more poor, poor people. Most young people are suffering from a drug crisis because they have no jobs, no employment, they can barely access quality education, and they've got no hope. Those are the things, issues that affect the daily struggle, the daily life of Zimbabwean people, that we're going to uh, address as our first order of business as a citizen's government that puts the citizens at the center. Let us look at um, your policy on human rights. Um, yes. uh, what, what is the alternative that people will look at? Because you've been complaining about um, you know, lack of human rights, uh, uh, targeting of opposition. What is it that people have to expect? Um, are you going to say, Parasida Zanu PF Ndopa Trugu Tangira, because you also want to consolidate no, power? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, under a triple C government, there'll be space for opponents. There will be space for everybody who's critical. Even we will not, PF. Even ZANU PF, you know, we're not going to kill you because you believe different. That is not the essence of freedom. But our overriding philosophy will be around constitutionalism. You know, upholding the Constitution from the Bill of Rights to respecting all the tenets uh, of the Constitution. You know, at the center of our human rights policy uh, are the right to life. You can't have a situation where someone goes to a triple C rally and is shot. 
comes back at Chituna, as we saw with Mboneni Nube. We can't have a situation where someone is in triple C, they're running voter registration campaigns like More Blessing Ali. Next thing, they're just taken out of a shopping center, abducted, killed, and found in four pieces in a well. That will never happen under tri a triple C government. You can't have a situation where an honorable member of parliament, in fact, two, you know, who are championing a work in their community, who are practicing their craft as lawyers, are arrested just because they believe different. That will never happen under a triple C government. You know, you won't have a situation where the law is weaponized to silence opposing critics. We see Tendai BT is in, uh, you know, in court for this charge. We see Job Sikala. We saw God see Godfrey uh, Sitole. We see uh, Karenyi Kore. Almost every single leader of the triple C has been in court for one a bogus charge with Yaba. Uh, and even if you look at how they're treated following incarceration, what explanation is there for the fact that Job Sikala is being held at Chikurubi maximum uh, prison in D-class and yet he hasn't been convicted? Why is he being held with convicted prisoners only because he believes in the triple C, only because he's spoken up and he wears yellow? That will never happen under a triple C government. Our government will uh, uphold the rule of law, it will uphold constitutionalism, and it will ensure that there's freedom, fairness, and opportunity for every single Zimbabwean, regardless of what your conviction is. Section 67 of the Constitution is very clear. Whether you believe in the triple C and ZANU PF and MDCA, up of the whatever party it is, you've got the freedom and right to do so, and we'll uphold that, especially within the bounds and parameters of our constitution. Hey, but Advocate Mayer, people have actually said that because they have not seen the triple C constitution, they do not know whether, as you run the triple C, you are actually running it constitutionally, and they then can't trust you well, to be constitutional. Uh, if you have power. You raise a good point. Now, as I've already said, uh, you know, the Triple C is yet to launch its party. All of those things will be laid bare. Uh, there's no such thing as, you know, having a baby being born today and tomorrow automatically they've got their O-level certificate. It doesn't work like that. There are processes, including, you know, democratic processes. And the whole essence of consultation is to ensure that it's a, a democracy. If you ask for Zaya Mahere to deliver a constitution for you within a day, I'll do it. That's what lawyers do. But will it be a democratically constituted document? No, because you haven't had the input of all the citizens and all the stakeholders you need. So we're trying to get the process right. So that this document is not just for 2022 or 2023. It has to last way beyond that. It's a constitution that's going to serve not only the generation of Blessed Mklanga, but his children's generation, his children's children's generation. So it's going to be the it's going to be worth the time that we're spending in making sure the document is fit for purpose. You know, there was a big question last year around the strategy of the opposition. And now we've delivered a strategy where uh, you know we are making sure that we have safeguards in place to mitigate against all the shenanigans of ZANU PF that we know, all the shenanigans of uh, you know state forces that we know, to ensure that this party, this movement, I beg your pardon, uh, it's not a political party. We've said it's a broad-based movement, is robust and can outlast uh, all the shocks that we've seen in our political space in Zimbabwe. And it's that consultation. Even if you look at how we've been running elections, the by-elections, it tells a big story about how democratic we are. You know, we've been doing things to a T, constitutionalism and putting citizens at the center. And so, you know, it, it, it certainly can't hold that we're acting in any way undemocratically. Now, you also speak about, um, you know, politics of tolerance. You speak about ensuring that those who are dissenting voices are actually part of uh, the, the, the Zimbabwe that you want to build. But we, we saw videos of people, um, your supporters, uh, running a mock in uh, uh, you know, destroying cars and, and, and being violent. And it, it, yet you speak about something else. Well, I think let's, we, we must set the record straight there. I mean, violence has no place in a constitutional democracy. And if you look at uh, the records and the facts, you'll see that at least three of the Nyatsime 15 uh, are citizens whose homes themselves were, were burnt. Uh, to date, we haven't seen the conviction of any triple uh, C members for violence. Um, we have not seen, uh, you know, any triple C member being um, convicted on account of a fair trial uh, for acting in an intolerant way. To the contrary, we're often criticized for not doing enough. Our member was murdered in cold blood. 
and we're saying let the law take its course. In fact, why Job Zikal is in jail today is for demanding that the police act in accordance with their constitutional mandate to secure life and property of Zimbabweans. Personal security is their responsibility. Even when Boneni Mube uh, was killed in open blood, remember when fire opened, uh, they came with axes, with machetes, with knob carries. What did President Chamisa say? He said, Mirai, Mirai, Havasi Vedu, even if you look at more blessing Ali's prayer service on the day that you make reference to, President Nelson Chamis was very clear. We don't do violence. We want the due process of the law to be followed. Even Job Sikala was present on that day to anyone who was present in Yatsima. So our record tells a different story uh, from what you wish to portray. We are a party of tolerance, a party of peace. Uh, you know, there have been various opportunities where we could have fought back, but we, we believe in non-violent resistance. That is part of the founding principles of our citizens' movement. We don't believe in violence, even when we are provoked significantly. Look at what ZANU-PF said about uh, President Chamisa. They said, look, we are threatening you with death. We're going to kill you in Gaurawi. And yet you see no action from ZANU-PF, and you didn't see us going after that uh, gentleman. You didn't see us going to his house. You saw what the councillor said in, in uh, Nyatsime. This is ZANU-PF territory. Since when is Zimbabwe, any part of it, ZANU-PF territory? What we know constitutionally is that everybody's got freedom of movement. And yet ZANU-PF does something else. There's something even more fundamental. Do you recall when ZANU-PF, a top leader in ZANU-PF, said we're going to crush the triple C like lice? What was our response? To come in our droves and vote decisively for change in the 26 March by-elections. If you look at all our rallies and you covered them, blessing, if you're to be honest, peaceful. Most of them, especially where there were no police officers, people would just sing, dance, and advocate for change in a better Zimbabwe. That's what we are as the triple C. In, in, in your response, you speak um, of the police uh, not coming to deal, to, to to perform their constitutional duty to, to arrest those um, who have um, threatened death on others. Um, what is then your fallback plan? Because um, this has been escalating. We have seen it escalating. Um, and and, and in, in your drive for peace, um, how are you going to make sure that, for instance, if I am attacked and, and um, I'm, I'm I lose property um, and then there's no restorative justice for me and probably I want to take that into my own hands because I'm hurt. What are you going to do as the leaders of those uh, people who are hurt on behalf of protecting or of advocating for the CCC? So what we've said as the triple C is that violence is never an option. It's not part of our philosophy whatsoever. We believe in peace, we believe in non-violent, peaceful resistance. I want to make that categorically clear. What we do disagree with, however, is the continued weaponization and abuse of the police service by ZANU-PF to try and silence political opponents. That we're opposed to. A police service should be professional, it should be non-partisan, it should be independent, they should carry out their duties without fear or favor. It shouldn't matter that the person who is committing the violence or who is uh, you know, inciting violence or who is uh, speaking hate speech and intolerance is a member of ZANU-PF, they must be held to account and we continue to demand that. Uh, we obviously look at other tools that are available to us to ensure that we hold the executive to account in that regard, uh, whether it's litigation, whether it's political pressure, but I think what's clear is that, you know, the whole world can see Mr. Mnangagwa and his regime for what they are, a violent, corrupt dictatorship. And this is essentially what we are saying Zimbabwe does not need at the moment. Zimbabwe deserves leaders who are ethical, who put the citizens first, who believe in peace. We shouldn't waste so much time in court on spurious charges. This is time that young people should be spending at school, you know, being entrepreneurs, innovating, building the country, being productive, and yet so much time, even court time, courts that are built or and established constitutionally to ensure that they bring criminals to justice, whether it's rapists, murderers, thieves, those who are corrupt, are now wasting time dealing with matters of triple C. Court is now like a triple C rally almost every single day, just because you've got a regime that's paranoid, that's afraid of change, and that's afraid of the citizens. We can't go on like that. Let me take you to the Zimbabwe Electoral uh, Commission. Um, this is going to be a very critical uh, area for, for 
as you fight to attain power. Now, there has been um, this information that a daughter of a top and a senior Zanupi of politician is now a commissioner who is going to play referee between her father and other players. Now, let's talk about that. Well, thank you. Uh, you raise a very important issue around one of our top priorities in terms of our 2022 agenda, which is the electoral reform agenda. We've said time and again that ZEC, as, it as it's currently constituted, is not fit for purpose. Look at Jasper Mangwana. Here's someone who donned Nangagwa scarf, who said Pamberene is on PF, and yet he's now speaking for what's supposed to be an independent electoral management body. And look at the daughter you spoke of, Miss Mohadi. I mean, you know, legally, you can't have a situation where someone has an interest in their own cause, and it's not just actual bias, but the appearance of bias. You know, there's been no corporate governance. Even if you look at how she performed in the interview, she didn't perform well, but even beyond that, she's clearly partisan and not someone who's objective. This country is full of a capable, competent, competent citizens who could operate in that role, and yet they don't. So if anything, this appoint, appointment demonstrates beyond any doubt uh, what we've said consistently, that ZEC as it's currently constituted is not fit for purpose. The constitution is very clear about what ZEC should be. It should be independent, it should be non-partisan, um, it should be professional, it should be able to deliver a free, fair and verifiable transparent election. Currently what we've seen speaks to, to the contrary and if you look at even the reforms that we demand, respect for the right to vote, if you look at uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that they are denying citizens access to register to vote, I mean you can't put a, a registration centre 10, 20, 30 kilometres away from the citizens and say find your way there. When we then mobilise people to go to those registration centres, you hear Zek saying no there's no power, our machines are down, this and that, all trying to suppress the urban vote. When they go into rural areas or areas they perceive Zanu PF to be strong, you see them acting diligently and conducting all these campaigns to make sure people they think uh, are their supporters, whether Maposter or whoever, are registered. That's not the way ZEC should operate if they're being professional. The right to vote must be fully facilitated. That includes the diaspora vote. If you let's look at Section 155 of the Constitution, the only qualification for one to be a voter in this country is that they're above 18 years and that they're a citizen, regardless of your location. So there's been a lot of dishonesty around the failure to implement the diaspora vote. The same goes for the prison vote. The fact that you are in jail is not a bond to you voting and yet we've seen again Zek refusing to implement the prison vote and so you know we want a situation where they're robust about ensuring that people register Secondly, there has to be a credible voters' role. I mean, the irregularities in the voters' role simply can't be tolerated. Uh, the fact that Blessed goes to uh, ex polling station wanting to vote and suddenly his name is not there. His wife's name is there. You're told, no, go and look in all the other wards and check if your, your, your name might be at some other polling station. That simply can't be allowed to take place. That's not what the Constitution uh, mandates. Even if you look at... Um, the irregularities around um, making sure they publish the voters' role. We need voters' role with pictures. That's what the law says. So that if you say that there are 20 blessed and clangers, we want to know that for sure there are 20 different uh, blessed and clangers and that there are no ghost voters. We've spoken again about security of the, the vote, making sure that polling material is secure, making sure that the personnel and officials that uh, ZEC employs are people who are not partisan, people who are not uh, members of ZANU-PF. We've spoken about about the need for uh, media reforms to ensure that there's a free and fair uh, playing field. We've spoken about the fact that there has to be uh, you know, resolution of this vote buying crisis that you've got. You can't have a ward where someone is giving away you know, $100 to each person who can demonstrate or show a slip that they voted ZANU-PF. That's not a free and fair election. There has to be security and safety for the voter themselves. These incidents of political violence are simply unacceptable. That people get persecuted for voting one way or the other. The fact that that our traditional leaders sometimes are co-opted by ZANU-PF to ensure that they do their bidding. We've seen what happened in Kariba and Chipinge with the assisted voter uh, crisis where the sabuku says, no, we are kumba kwangu, mese mchano prekez wa kutumono vota, kutumone kwe kunzima vota pa that can't be allowed in a free and fair election. So when all is said and done, we continue to clamor for these reforms. We continue to demand them. We're pursuing litigation, political pressure to ensure that we have uh, an election in 2023 that is not disputed.
But these are the same things that you were talking about in t before 2018, um, uh, the election. Well, it's not just us. I mean, even if you look at the International Observer missions, they're very clear about what would make a credible election. Yes, in sure. Zimbabwe. But, but the issue is that it's not being delivered. So no, what are you, what, what are you going to do continue, about it? We continue to hold ZEC to account. We if it's not to delivered. Pressurize them. We will continue to pressurize them because voting is the, is the constitutional imperative of every single Zimbabwean. No institution, no political party has the power to take that away. And, and so we, every single citizen, it's all hands on deck to ensure that that is not done again. Even if you look at how we've treated uh, the election since our birth as a new political party, it hasn't been business as usual. We've ensured that we defend the vote. We've unearthed irregularities. We've uh, ensured, uh, held ZEC to account even at the polling stations to say, look, there are these five bases in Kariba where people are being given money, disband them now. You know, we've been so active and so robust. And I think we have to say thank you to the citizen polling agents who've been doing that. Again, a sign that there's uh, incredible organization um, in the triple C. So defending the vote is going to be a key imperative. And I think that's one of the things that distinguishes this coming election from previous ones. We've had polling agents at every single polling station, mm -hmm. in every single province, in every single by-election that's been held. That's never been done before for but, a very long time. But and I, I think that does make a difference because even if you look at how they hold the presiding officer to account, they stop irregularities from happening, they make sure that they've got their V11s, all of that is done to ensure that the vote uh, you know, is secure. So it's not as though we're just clamoring uh, for electoral reforms and not doing the, the heavy lifting that's supposed to come with it. Okay, but Africa, my, my, when a president of a country sits there and appoints a commissioner for ZEC, who he knows fully well, is the daughter of his vice president. I mean, is that not saying, is, th is that not a statement to you that there is no interest whatsoever to bring about that fairness that you want? Frankly, uh, it's a statement that that so-called leader knows that he cannot win a free and fair election. He knows that if he doesn't try and steal the vote, he won't win and that he's lost popular support. And I think if anything, uh, you know, credit must be given to the Triple C for coming up with a mass movement in a short space of time. Even the data from Afrobarometer is very clear that we are leading. If a snap election were to be held today, the Triple C would win. And so Zano PF's back is against the wall. They're afraid and they're trying to employ all methods available to them to try and rig the election. And we're saying no. We're not going to back down. Try the intimidation, try the arrest, try the persecution, the murders, the abductions. We're going to stand firm because we believe in change and transformation for the Zimbabwean people. We simply want a Zimbabwe that delivers for the citizens. Mm. Someone walking past the state house would look at the massive investment that has been put there and some have said that it shows, clearly shows that those in office don't want to live. Well, you know, ZANU PF will continue to sponsor the narrative that elections don't work. If they didn't work, they would not invest so hard in trying to rig them. They know that elections work. And the citizens deep in their heart know that elections work, which is why we're working so hard to ensure that in the next election we've got the six million votes to ensure that we win Zimbabwe for change. It doesn't matter, you know, they say, you say it's their investment. It's the investment of the citizens, of taxpayers, that's going in there for whoever wins that election. And we know that if the citizens come together with a huge show of force, register to vote in their millions, come up on voting day, turn out to vote like never before, ensure that they defend the, their vote. We're going to come up with a le an election victory that allows us to form a citizen's government that then delivers change and transformation for the people. Ethical leaders, leaders that you can be proud of, whether it's at council level, at parliamentary level, at presidential level, people who actually put the citizens first. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about resources as well. This has been a big issue and um, in previous reports, the Zimbabwe Election Support Network has actually said that ZANU PF um, has been using state resources to fund its personal campaigns. Um, when their ministers go, they use fuel as ministers and stuff like that. You have no access to such large risks. How are you going to compete? Now, what's funny is despite their theft and abuse of state uh, resources to try and do the bidding of ZANU PF, they continue to lose elections. Uh, they're not winning. They're stealing taxpayer money. And I think the citizens have been very clear in making a statement to say that, look, you are not the leaders 
that are fit for purpose. Now, we are a citizen movement and the citizens will fund their struggle. And I think, you know, if you look at the electoral victories of the Triple C, they've been despite the odds, despite the electoral manipulation, despite the theft of our resources, uh, you know, by ZANU PF, despite the attempt to stifle, you know, contributions towards us, we continue to win. That says something. And a platform is being set up, and I'm sure it will be announced and rolled out in due course where citizens can freely put in their dollar, their ten dollars, their hundred dollars to ensure that we win Zimbabwe for change. We certainly can do it. Mm. And, and lastly, as we, as we close, let us talk about the attacks on, um, or the alleged attacks on your leaders. Um, well, they're not alleged. I think they're clear for, clear for everybody to see. Let's talk about them. Yes, the mm. murders, the abductions. I mean, we still have not had justice for Bonini Mube. We're not gonna keep quiet about that. We still haven't had a justice for Mo Blessing Ali, who was murdered in cold blood and found at the home of a ZANU-PF activist. You know, we still have the political persecutions of uh, Job Sikala, who's facing a, a, a very irregular charge, double jeopardy, where you charge someone with, uh, you know, two offenses rising from the same facts. Even a first year law student will tell you that that's incompetent. It's a clear a sign of persecution. The lawfare against our members at, uh, you know, every single level, the violence that we're seeing in villages when someone just says they're triple C, uh, you know, food aid is weaponized against them. Actual violence is meted out. We saw what happened uh, in talk at the weekend, just because people are mobilizing and running around and registering people, they get beaten uh, like animals by Zanu PF. You know, it's, it's, it's something that really has to change and we continue to call for the region to take notice. You know, part of our electoral reform pre-election pact actually calls for long-term monitoring of the election by election observers, otherwise it will be a bloodbath. And it's a bloodbath not in the sense that we want violence, but they meet violence out against us. You saw the beating and the, the pictures, the images that came out of Mtoko. Did we fight back? Did we hit anyone back? No, because we believe in non-violence. But with that should come, uh, you know, accountability and the police acting in terms of the constitution. What we clearly have in Zimbabwe is a huge governance crisis, a socio-economic and political crisis. We've got the highest hyperinflation rate in the world, the highest rate of extreme poverty in the region. We are the sick man. Uh, of Africa in a number of respects, and that has to change. And the only way that can change is that if, you know, the social contract between the governed, governed and those who are governing is restored, there's been a complete breakdown. That's why the economy is no longer serving the people. They can print as many, uh, you know, notes as they like. They can pretend that they're issuing gold coins. They can come up with whatever gimmicks. They can freeze bank lending. Whatever it is they try won't work. Because the underlying root cause of the problem, the abuse of citizens, you should never look at it as violence against the triple C. It's violence against citizens who just want better. Their only crime is to want a better Zimbabwean, and so they're, Zimbabwe, and so they're beaten, they're tortured, they're abducted, and they're murdered. Mm. You know, we can't go forward as a country yeah. like yeah. that. How, how is this affecting you? Because like, as you were speaking, um, Tendai BT, um, is an accused. Lynette Kairin Kore is an accused. Um, Amos uh, Chibaya is an accused. Job Scala, Godfrey Stolle, um, you know, uh, the entire... I'm an accused. <laughs> you, you are an accused as well. Yes. You know what, uh, blessed, I'll tell you one thing, and I also want to say this to Zanupi, if we're not going to back down because you try the games of persecution, you know, we are ready because we're dealing with a violent, ruthless dictatorship that's corrupt and that needs to go. We always knew that they were going to try and do everything to try and remain in power. But we stand firm and I think one of the biggest victories of the Triple C is that we're still standing. You know, no other opposition party in the region has to face what we face. And yet we continue to push forward. We saw that uh, President Chamiso's car was shot at. Uh, you know, we, we saw the bullet holes in the car when he was doing the meet the people tour that she asked about earlier death threats, these genocidal threats that they're going to crush us like lies, the beatings, the abductions, the torture, the murder, and yet we remain steadfast because we believe that this is the only way we can deliver change for the people. You know, it is a struggle. We've budgeted for it, but we're not going to stop demanding better for this country because this country is a jewel. Everybody knows that Zimbabwe is great. It's just in the hands of the wrong people, and that 
is what we seek to change in 2023 mm. and to solve this problem once and for all so that the people can be happy again. We've seen people um, uh, in the past weeks, they've put a spotlight on yourself and some have asked you to step down. Let's talk about that. I mean, frankly, you know, it, it raises the important uh, issue around women participation in politics that you can make up scandals uh, about someone. And I assure you, blessed, that everything that has been said uh, about my character, the attempts to smear me, uh, are untrue. And I think I've briefed my lawyers who are taking steps uh, and employing legal remedies to ensure that justice is done in that respect. But I think what it speaks to, in my view, is further panic on the part of the regime. They think that by telling lies about me that they'll silence me, it's never going to work. I'll continue to speak out, uh, inspire hope and a thirst for change for uh, Zimbabweans. And you know, one of the big founding principles of the Triple C and President Chamisa has spoken to it is ethical leadership. We do believe in that. Uh, we believe in integrity, we believe in citizens doing the right thing, and we'll never stop doing that. And, you know, I think my lawyers will say to me, don't comment too much on matters that are sub judice, so I won't. But you know, what, what will never happen with me certainly uh, is backing down. That's simply not an option. But as you sit here, you assure the people of Zimbabwe that you are not part of breaking people's homes as absolutely, has been alleged. Absolutely not. There is no truth whatsoever to those allegations. None whatsoever. Fadzai, uh, Advocate Fadzaime, I will ask you to, as we close, to just look the people of Zimbabwe and tell them what Zimbabwe should expect from the Triple C. What, from your heart, um, not a question from me, but as I usually do with all my guests, I'll give them a free reign at the end of the program to say things that are coming from their heart. Uh, to the people of Zimbabwe. Now, to the people and the citizens of Zimbabwe, I just wish to say that, um, you know, the, the crisis Zimbabwe finds itself in is a crisis that was completely avoidable and should never happen. The fact that, uh, you know, women give birth on the side of the road because the cl clinics have no capacity. The fact that our children can barely get to grade seven and you've got a 0% pass rate in a number of schools. The fact that we can barely put food on the table. The fact that our wages have been eroded by hyperinflation. All of those daily struggles you face are a result of poor leaders, leaders that, that don't care about you, that are not interested in the welfare of the people. What the Triple C promises is to to resolve this problem and solve it at its root, to ensure that you've got ethical leaders that take the resources of Zimbabwe and ensure that this country starts to work for the many and not the few. We believe that we are stronger together, which is why you know we style ourselves as a movement which has got space and is a broad tent for everybody who believes in progress for this nation. And so we continue to encourage everybody, young and old, but especially the young people of Zimbabwe, let's invest in our future by ensuring that we're all registered to vote. If six million of us come out in July 2023, we'll be having a very different conversation and we will win Zimbabwe for change. Thank you very much, Advocate Fazai Mayer, for, for having us here and, and talking to us. Um, I, I had to ask you the last question, but, yeah, but this interview was not about you, no, it no, was about, it was not about a problem. I'm team. accountable, I have to be accountable to the people, I have no difficulty with that. Beautiful. Now, this is the free talk in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and I was with Advocate Fadzai Mahere and we were speaking about the policies, the alternative, what the Triple C um, offers to the people of Zimbabwe and this is HSTV, it is an alternative platform where everybody should be had, where every voice matters and that the people of Zimbabwe in a democracy need to know their leaders. In the new Zimbabwe, you'll have a license, that's for sure, a TV license. I can guarantee you that, blessed. In, uh, we are waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Zimbabwe. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Free Talk in Proud Partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. This is our country. Now, as we go into the 2023 general elections, we implore on the people of Zimbabwe to exercise their rights to vote in a peaceful, free and fair manner, in a manner that will re reflect the wishes of the people of Zimbabwe so that we can begin to move our country into a developmental state. 
and we should not spill blood on account of politics. The next person is your relative, is your sister, is your mother. Please, let us not do the bidding of politicians by killing each other. Let's just vote. For you to vote, you need to be registered to vote. So register to vote and participate democratically in building Zimbabwe. I am your host as usual, Dara B. Thank you very much.